Welcome everybody. So tonight we've got a pretty uh, full program. So we have uh, two two lightning talks, a community, and also the uh, folks in Google Research, and then we have uh, two main speakers. So my name is Clive Bolton, and so <coughs> and uh, help organize the GDG Google Developer Group. Um, if you have any topics you'd like to see us cover, please don't hesitate to uh, drop us a note on the Meetup. Perhaps, uh, however, that feels comfortable. And uh, so, I wanted to uh, kick off with Wayne, who's going to talk us about something interesting. <laughs> Hello, can you guys hear me? Okay. Um, Okay, my name is Blaine Anderson, and I work for HTC as a developer evangelist. And what I wanted to talk to you guys about real quick was give you an int introduction to um, our dual lens SDK, which just came out with the um, HTC M8. Um, so the way that the dual lens, S what the dual lens SDK does, is it gives you the ability to uh, edit your photos in a way that um, you haven't really been able to do before. Um, what we have here is what we call U focus. And so you'll notice on the right-hand side is a standard picture, and on the left-hand side, using the U-focus effect, it kind of gives you that professional blurry background. Um, we also have foreground effects, so a similar concept where it's manipulating the background. Uh, it does this with what we call our dual sensor technology. So you have a single camera in the front that's four ultra pixels, and then you have a second lens, uh, which is a depth sensor, basically, that gives you a depth map that will allow you to use some of these different effects. Um, you also have these little seasons. I don't have my plug-in hooked up where you can actually see these animations, but um, they have summer, spring, winter, fall. It'll show snowflakes falling, leaves falling. Um, again, these are all some of the things that are done with our SDK. Um, you also have what's called the dimension plus effect. Uh, this will give gives two-dimensional images a 3D effect. So when you actually tilt the camera to the left or to the right, um, you get this, this 3D image. Um, I have a M8 on me, so if any of you are interested in something like this, feel free to meet, come see me afterwards, and I'll show you some of these different effects and how it works, and I'll give you a live demo there. Um, another one's the copy and paste. Uh, again, a lot of it you can kind of see is that it's, it's based on the depth map that we have in the background that'll uh, give you the ability to cut and paste, to change the background, um, to change the focus, whether it's foreground or background. Um, here's a little bit about our camera that we have there. Like I said, um, these are the pixel sizes. This is some more of the technical specs. Um, if you guys want more information on something like this, please let me know, and uh, I can definitely get you that. This is a one of our partners that we had, and what they did is that with their proprietary technology and our partner SDK, they were able to take a take a basic picture of this stuffed animal. Um, and using our SDK, they were able to change it into a 3D model. Uh, this model is, I wish I had the program that actually would show it, but it, it, it's really cool what they did as far as being able to create essentially a 3D image from a single picture. Um, so we have a number of different partners that we're working with on this. Um, this is just kind of one example. Um, we will also be hosting a workshop here in the next couple weeks that we will go through and we'll give you some of the examples, we'll give you some M8s to play with. So if anyone is interested in this technology or wants to get more of it, um, come find me afterwards. I'll get your email address, I'll give you mine, and you guys uh, um, will send out the invites once we've established the date and the time. We're targeting somewhere around the beginning to middle of June. Um, that is kind of tentative, but we're hoping at least within the next month or so that we'll be able to put something together and host this, this workshop for you guys. Um, so yeah, that's it, and again, if you guys have any questions, my name is Blaine, and feel free to come find me. Yeah. Question: How sensitive is the depth? Like, how accurate? Um, it's. I can show you something afterwards. That we have two SDKs. We have our OpenSense SDK, which is open to anybody, and then we have a partner SDK. Um, the partner SDK does give you a little bit more refinement, um, and I've got a couple examples that I can show you that'll distinguish the, the difference between the two. Yes. Yeah. The file format open. No, not the depth image is encrypted. Um, so no, not at this point. Why? Why is the depth map encrypted? Yeah. Um, 
I can't speak on that. <laughs> but it it is. Um, it, yeah, no, I, I get that. Um, if you want to give me your email address, though, afterwards, um, we can talk. Is there anybody else? Any questions? No? OK, thanks. These are the folks who make it easy for me to develop on Google Cloud. Yeah, something like that. So, yeah, I'm Jill Hadar, and I am an Ben. We work for WSX here at Google, so we're basically user researchers who work specifically with the developer population. So our job is to go out and speak to developers to make sure we're developing the correct products and redirecting products that need to be redirected. Um, we are going to be set up outside with two Chromebooks. I think a lot of you have already signed up. We're basically looking to um, have some of you sign up for our studies. We try to recruit here in Seattle and then also down in Mountain View about a study a week. Uh, they usually take about an hour or two to participate in. Um, they range um, from working with an API, working on command line, using the developer console. We're interested in all of that stuff. Um, and we're interested in people who work on different platforms, use different languages. So we're just looking to build our population as quickly as possible and recruit you for these studies. You get paid like a hundred bucks or so to participate in them, but more importantly, your voice is actually heard as we develop these products. You can take the time to sign up. We'd really appreciate it. So I don't, <clears throat> don't know if we have any other lightning talks, but perhaps if you do, we can we can run those uh, in the middle or at the end. So just let me know uh, one way or another. And so, Brian. Okay. Hi everybody. This is the point in the evening where you get to watch me fiddle with projectors. Um, it's very exciting. Oh, oh, nice. You know, there's a few like unsolved problems, you know, in in computers. Um, projectors is is one that I would put up there in the mix. Yeah, but projectors are apparently harder. <laughs> It's, it's, it's a thing. It's legit. Now machine unlearning. Machine unlearning. Okay. Moment of truth. And Chromecast is going to be working on the video campus. So networking is also hard. OK. So we have slides. We've got things on screen. I think we are ready. Um, if I talk in this kind of voice, can everybody hear me in the room? Good? OK. I'll leave the camera that direction a little bit. Um, press magic buttons and rant and walk. So hi, everybody. Take two. Um, thank you all for coming out tonight, um, spending the evening with us. Uh, we've got two um, cloud talks, myself and Paul. Um, and we're going to do kind of different stuff. So this talk is about kind of this compute continuum, right? So uh, this is the other traditional part of the talk, where I, I want to kind of get a sense of who's, who's in the room. So how many people here have uh, know what App Engine is and have built something on App Engine? A little bit? OK, awesome. And know what Compute Engine is? Ooh, spun up an instance on Compute Engine? Awesome. OK. <laughs> we're like, we're among friends. <laughs> awesome. So, um, so the, the, the core of this talk tonight is really about like, um, kind of connecting these two things. Um, so we kind of think of like most of the, the ways you can run your code right now kind of fall into one of these two, two camps of you get a whole bunch of uh, agility because you get to like build on top of something like App Engine or you know Heroku or like these other folks who like handle a whole bunch of infrastructure for you, uh, automation like maybe you know scaling up and scaling down as you get different uh, amounts of traffic to your site, things like that. Um, but there's almost always some kind of limitation, right? So like in App Engine today, like you might not be able to run all of the libraries you want. You need a particular C library and you can't get that, or um, things of that nature. And so. On the other side, you've got things like compute engines, where you get like a virtual machine, and like you've got an operating system, and you can do whatever you want there, right? Um, 
but you've got a virtual machine and an operating system, so you have to like take care of everything. Like keep the OS up to date, you know, like handle load balancing yourself, like roll out new versions of your software, all that kind of stuff. So um, what we want is to like actually get the best of both worlds. Um, and we are honestly kind of in the early days of this, right? So it's three steps, but I'd like to share some of the stuff um, that we've got now and some kind of hints of the future. So we want to see like all the flexibility you want and ease of management and automation and basically best of both worlds in these things. So, so a, first, a first cut at this is managed VM. And so I have to ask this question now too because it's out. How many people have heard of managed VMs and kind of know what they are? Okay, so we've got some in here. So I'm repeating a bit, apologies, and enjoy. Hopefully this is uh, like I add a little bit more to it. Um, so the main thing is that you get all of Compute Engine and most of App Engine with the automation for you. So um, any C libraries you need to run, if you need to open sockets and listen on them, um, you want to run uh, long running services, uh, that sort of thing, you can do all of that in managed VM. Like, so you've got access to all the, the native machine. You can um, do all of the, 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 you know, avoid all the limitations that you might have run into before. But at the same time, you get um, most of the app engine stuff. So you get the uh, high availability. You get uh, security patches installed for you. Um, if for example, like so App Engine handles a bunch of things behind the scenes. You know, if you get a bunch of um, traffic in one area or we need to move data centers because something's happened at one of our data centers, um, in that kind of scenario, if you've got an App Engine app that's part straight App Engine and part managed VMs, we'll move both of them together. So there's a bunch of uh, behind the scene DevOps, like gnarly hard work that you get to just take advantage of and happens for you. Um, and there's a bunch of cool stuff in in App Engine, like you guys are probably familiar with versions and the like, so you push a new version and you give it some percentage of your traffic, see how things work. So you can get that in a, in a managed uh, virtual machine environment as well. So you can push code there and get this. And by the way, this is all straight App Engine code. So if you've got you know, code in Java, Python, whatever, hitting App Engine APIs with data store or other things, you can run that same code. So you just change the app config a little bit, you change your configuration, and push it up, and it's actually running on Compute Engine instances. Um, and then you can do things like in Python land, you know, import SciPy or you know, all kinds of you know, low-level C stuff that you need to do crazy things. So that's the general idea there. So, so far, managed VMs, uh, best of both worlds. Um, how we got to that, so there's a couple layers underneath this that we're also exposing at the same time. So uh, we're going to get this whole continuum here. So replica pools is one of them. So um, you know, Google builds a lot of uh, you know, big systems, right? And you know, the pattern that shows up over and over and over again is you've got a pool of similar machines that need to do the same work, and you want them to be healthy and be configured the same way, and you want them to all be identical. So replica pools is an API for building a pool of identical virtual machines. So instead of setting up uh, one virtual machine, you basically set up your startup scripts and send them off to this replica pool, and then tell the pool, I'd like 10 instances of this virtual, of this kind of service. And it will start up 10 virtual machines, and then later that day you're like, oh, I want 15 now. And it will spin up five more and make them exactly the same, and then you're like, oh, no, I want five now. And so the API for this is initial configuration, and then just set how many of the instances you want running, uh, running your service. Um, yeah, so you choose the image, metadata stuff, and bash scripts to set things up. And like regular Compute Engine, these bash scripts, the startup scripts, can kick off other configuration tools. You know, so if you're already using Chef or Puppet or these things, you can use that to kick off the actual um, configuration of your environment for your app. So replica pools, um, so the managed VM stuff is kind of built on top of replica pools. Um, but you also have access directly to replica pools if you want that. And then uh, we hit Deployment Manager. And Deployment Manager is like uh, sets of replica pools. So a common situation might be you've got uh, your database servers that are all in a, in a pool, and maybe you have some front-end servers, and maybe you have some back-end processing servers. And you can have a Deployment Manager template that defines these three pools 
and what size they are initially and what startup and setup they have and how they should talk to each other. And then you can push this whole thing as one. Um, and then you can override individual parameters. And what that lets you do is say, boom, I want to push a test environment. And I want to only have just one server, and I want them all to be like micro, micro VM. Just make sure all the pieces talk to each other. And then, OK, I want um, you know, a staging server, and we'll run all our big tests on that and do some load testing. And you can push the same template um, in the same exact configuration. And then when you're done with it, just shut it down. And of course, you can use the same thing to run production. So that's the general idea there. So all these pieces together, we end up with um, a spectrum from like just straight compute engine. So you want Google to handle network and disk and hardware failures, the physical machines, that sort of thing, like all taken care of. Everything from the OS up is you. Or you can move up a layer, and this, the replica pools will handle one more layer of things. So this is a pool of identical instances. If one of them goes unhealthy, uh, it'll get dropped from the pool and things like that. If you want to add more, you just call this API. You can move up another layer and get to full-on managed VMs. And so this looks a lot like App Engine in terms of your developer experience, but it's actually running on Compute Engine VMs. And then you've got full-on App Engine. Um, and you can, for your application, choose where you want to be on this level of abstraction, um, where it makes the most sense for speed or requirements you have, whatever else. And also, like especially the first two, um, they're App Engine module aware. So you can have particular parts of your application running in straight App Engine, another part of it running in managed VMs, and then another part running on straight Compute Engine. And that's a very common, common pattern, and this kind of helps unify the experience there. OK. So lots of words, right? So these are kind of big ideas. We want to uh, um, have a really big demo to show this off, right? So imagine, like, really big ideas. What would, what would show this demo off the best? Would it be Sudoku? <laughs> yeah. Like, so, so Sudoku is everywhere, right? It's like world phenomenon. Um, it's amazing. Um, it's kind of ridiculous as well as a, as a game. Um, someone described it as a denial of service for the human mind. <laughs> um, and so in, in that respect, it would be cool if we, could, if we could kind of get computers to help us with this very human task, right? So luckily, Peter Norvig, uh, the guy who kind of wrote the book on AI, artificial intelligence, wrote this fantastic article on how to solve every possible Sudoku puzzle. So this is one of the best examples of technical writing I've ever seen. It's really a fun read. Um, and it's got sample code, so we just, of course, just took that. Um, <laughs> but I want to solve, like, physical, real-world puzzles. Like, I want to be, like, you know, you're out and about, and you want to be like, yeah, you don't need to spend your time on that. We can just solve that, right? Um, but input's kind of hard, right? So what if we had a way to teach the computer to read, right? So there's this lovely library called OpenCV that you can feed it images, and it will do things like OCR text recognition. It can find uh, bounding boxes for example. Um, and so what we can do is we can glue these two things together and go to town and like uh, do that. But before managed VMs, we have this kind of question of like, well, this is kind of a, this is kind of a hack, right? We just want to put this together and like, like do something cool. But we actually have to kind of spin up a whole infrastructure because we need OpenCV, which is this C and C++ library. Um, can't run on straight app engine. I don't know how popular it's going to be. You know, all of these kind of questions, right? So perfect like fit for managed VM. So um, on this end, we've got just straight regular app engine, right? So this is a web app uh, that I'm going to show you. And it just gets straight requests to app engine, normal deal, um, and shows the HTML. When you submit an image as a form post, that gets sent off into a task queue. And then a back end on the managed VM side pulls those in, runs them through the OpenCV processing, and returns the result of a solve Sudoku puzzle. So from a developer standpoint, this looks like really similar. So like this is a regular app.yaml, and this is the backend YAML um, for this particular thing. And really, you add two bits. You say, I want, I want this to be hosted on virtual machines. And by the way, here's all the details. Like this is going to be like a single core standard one, and this magic. App get install all your dependencies, right? So as long as your dependencies are 
in app repositories, like you're good to go. Where you can just like have a common delimited list of of your stuff, and it gets set up before your code runs. Um, and App Engine handles all that for you. And then when you're ready to deploy, you push it out like a regular um, deal. So this is the, the, the modern equivalent of app config uh, deploy, or app config update. Um, OK, so that's enough words. Oh, hey. That is not it. There we go. OK, so real thing for camera. Hello, Seattle. <laughs> Hello, Google Developer Group. This is, this is the moment of truth, real live demos. They always work, right? Um, so we take a picture that shows up over here. And then on the right, we have an actual image. And when I click Solve, this is going to take that and send it up as a form post. It's going to go through the App Engine front end, pass it through task queues, off to the back end, get the answer back. And hopefully, we will get a solved puzzle out of this. And moment of truth, we are testing task queue yeah. response. <laughs> Thank you very much. So, and then this also works, it's a website, right? So it actually works on your phone, too. So you can actually just, like, come up behind somebody who's, like, wasting their time on to go to them. Are you good? <laughs> and, and I guarantee they'll be super, super thankful. <laughs> Every time, right? Okay. So... So that's the main deal. Um, and what this looks like in the back end, right? So we've got this going here. Um, same bit. And I just wanted to kind of reiterate this. This is just like your straight app, and you've got like one module, like regular front end, and another mm -hmm. module handling stuff on the back end. So um, you just use your the app engine stuff you know, and you get the virtual machines as well. Um, from a practical standpoint, the virtual machines are not auto-scaling. Um, as of today. Um, so that's obviously of interest, right? And like one of the core features of App Engine, so stay tuned. But the API for it is really straightforward right now. So in this particular app, what we're doing is we're actually watching the backlog on the task queue and it adjusting the number of processing machines to match that. So you can basically use whatever metrics matter for your application and say, okay, I want this many VMs to process that. Um, and you just hit that and go. <laughs> so in summary, it's a false choice. Technology is awesome. Please sign up. This is actually still in uh, Trusted Tester or Limited Preview. So here is the sign up link for Managed VM if you want to do this. Um, so sign up at that link or grab me afterwards and I will get it to you. And also, I want to just toss in like this is like we're just barely getting started with this. Um, expect all kinds of interesting things um, like running up to IO and at IO in another month. Um, got lots of good things to talk about in this space. So uh, thank you all very much for having me here. Yes, and I'll be. Um, what, uh, what OSs are supported on that? Okay, so right today, it's Linux OSs. So uh, always just Ubuntu or different variants? I think it's always Debian right now. Um, and the app get stuff is kind of related to that. To be honest, I'm not completely sure how this would play out with Windows boxes. Right. We're going to need a different uh, config hook in the or, Windows or Red Hat or yeah. yeah. I think Red Hat and those guys, they have their own package managers that are kind of like well understood, so it'll be the equivalent there. But um, Windows is a different question. Can you integrate that in with, with Chef or Puppet right. pieces as well? Uh, yes, absolutely. So um, it's a little weird. Like, so once you want to be like owning the box, like, you Not usually. Uh, the managed VM actually like, boots up your app engine code. So like you know, in the same way you have a main, your normal app engine, right, app, right. like it does that. Now it's not to say it's a real box. You can shell out and do all kinds of crazy stuff, and sometimes that's appropriate. Like if you want to um, set up a chat server next to your app, for example, you can do that. Uh, something that like handles like long running connections, uh, things like that, you can do that. But most of the time, people are running kind of request oriented code. Um, but if you have a scenario where you need backends that live a long time or have a lot of um, stuff you need to put in the local cache or disk, things like that, like this can be a really good solution.
So do you use, use bill for the instance then for the yes. duration? Yeah, so the billing works exactly like compute engines. Okay. So like as your you have instances spun up, they charge their straight compute engine, right? It's just all managed by the app engine. Right. Yep. Okay. Any more questions? Sweet. Okay. Off to Paul, and I will look into cooling this room down. Thanks, Brian. So I don't have a cool demo. Sorry. Um, so just lots of talking, lots of words. Hopefully I can still be uh, at least interesting and exceed expectations and even be entertaining. Um, so my name is Paul Newsom. I'm a developer advocate. You can see there's another name on the slide here that's crossed out. Uh, Michael Lynn is a principal engineer at the cloud platform. He's a fantastic guy. He's also incredibly busy. Um, he developed this fantastic presentation for one of our events, which I have shamelessly stolen and adopted as my own. Um, what I like about this presentation is uh, I'm not going to talk about any particular product. Um, what I'm going to do is talk about, uh, you know, there's, there's the theme here basically is it's the Google Cloud Platform, keyword here being Google. Um, this is built on top of a very deep reservoir of Google technologies that we've been working on for a long time for our own needs. And now we're surfacing these things in our Cloud Platform. I joined Google about three and a half years ago. And the main reason I came to Google was because I really wanted to get my hands on some of these cool technologies that I was reading about in these academic papers. And the only way to do that three and a half years ago was to come here, do an interview loop, you know, get some people to think you're smart, and then get a, get a Google badge and come to work. And then you got to play with all these toys. The cool thing now is all of you guys get to play with our toys. Um, and that's lots of fun. So what the top 10 edition is about is Ten cool things about Google, mostly, and, and things that show up in the, in the cloud platform that you may not have thought of that may be somewhat surprising or at least entertaining and interesting. Um, now, I said I wasn't going to talk about our products, but I gave this talk a little while ago, and I got to the end of it, and people said, but do you have a thing that does this? Now, with this audience, it's probably less of a problem. So here's the obligatory, we have these things slide. So we have App Engine, Compute Engine, and manage VMs coming soon. Thankfully, I don't need to go into that because Brian has given you a wonderful introduction to that. On the storage side, we have Cloud Storage, which is blob storage. Uh, cloud SQL, which is just MySQL in the cloud. Cloud Data Store, which if you've used App Engine, you're familiar with. Um, we have BigQuery, which is a really awesome product. It's based on an internal technology called Dremel. You load your data into BigQuery, and you can query massive data sets incredibly quickly with uh, SQL-like language. Um, and Cloud Endpoints is a way that you can take your code and surface an API that kind of looks and feels like a Google API does. So there's the things. Hopefully um, that will give you some context for the top 10 that I'm about to go into. So using Google technologies to build a better cloud. I already touched on this, but the theme you're going to hear over and over is our cloud platform is built on Google. We've been doing cloud computing for a really long time. We've built some really cool tools to do it, and now we're surfacing those in a way that can be used outside of Google. So number 10, sharks with frickin' lasers. Well, it's a great title for a slide, isn't it? And there isn't a shark in sight. What, what we do have pictures of here is networks. Um, and on the left side of the slide, you see uh, um, you know, a representation of our inter-data center network. We're using, uh, we've got you know, uh, um, an absolutely world-class um, inter-data center network connecting our data centers to one another. In the center, you see a map of some of our peering locations where we peer with other networks. And on the right side, of course, is the Google Fiber logo. So what, what does this have to do with each other? The idea here is that Google has always delivered our products to our users over a network. This is what we have done from the first days of search. So having a fantastic network with which to deliver those products to our users, low latency stuff like search, uh, high volume stuff like YouTube, uh, real time stuff like Hangouts, having a fantastic network with which to deliver um, those services has always been core to Google. Guess what? You run your code in App Engine, you run your code in um, Compute Engine, your code's running on this network. Your customers are connecting to your code over this network as well. But the slide says sharks, all we see are bunnies. So show me the sharks. So here we have a shark. 
And that is an undersea fiber cable. That's your laser. <laughs> so this is an unusual DevOps challenge. You know, most startups <laughs> don't have to deal with this. Um, but when you want, run a network the size that we do, this is the kind of weird stuff that happens. And there's other stories out there. You can go Google them if you want to. Very funny stories about things that happen to fiber cables in the wild. Um, this is our problem. This isn't your problem, right? And this is one of the things that running on our network gets you. We deal with the sharks, so you don't have to. <laughs> All right, nine, fast free connections to Google. Well, in addition to our cloud platform, we've got some other good stuff out there. We've got Google Drive. We've got Google Maps. We've got YouTube. If you are uh, doing ad bidding, we've got this double-click ad exchange. There's how many how many Google APIs are there total? Like it's a big three-digit number. You know, there's a lot of stuff out there that you can uh, a lot of APIs you can use to program Google basically. If you are programming Google from our cloud platform, you have low latency, high bandwidth connections to all of these other Google services for free. So if the application that you're thinking of um, say integrates with Google Plus or integrates with Google Plus Hangouts, for example. Doing it in our cloud platform is obviously a, a really great place to do that. Google scale. So we run some reasonably big properties. That's probably not going to surprise anybody. Um, and the, the technology that we're surfacing in our cloud platform is based on the same technology we've used internally to deliver these things like search and YouTube and Hangouts. Um, so as an example of this, um, the load balancer that's available to you for use with your compute engine instances is based on the same technology we use to load balance search and all of our other properties. So we ran an experiment where we said, let's just see what happens if we throw a million QPS at a bunch of uh, compute engine machines. So what we see here is um, basically we set up some, some compute engine instances ready to take requests, some compute engine instances ready to send requests, put a load balancer between them, turned everything on, and collected some data. So here we see uh, it takes about four seconds, and there's a million QPS slamming. QPS. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, QPS is a query per second. We measure everything in queries because of, uh, because of our search heritage. Uh, outside of Google, it's often called requests per second. But basically, it's a million requests. So we see a million requests coming in after about um, two minutes, everything is sort of stabilized out and it becomes completely boring from then on. It's just serving a million requests, a million requests, a million requests, and then we shut the experiment down. Um, this ex whole experiment cost about $10 to run on our, on our platform, and this was before the price cuts we announced a couple months ago. So it would be cheaper to do this today. Um, so are you going to need to serve a million requests per second? The answer is probably no. But do you know how many requests? you're going to need to serve? The answer to that might also be no. So it's good to know that, you know, maybe it's 10,000, maybe it's 1,000, maybe it's 50,000, maybe it's even 100,000, but it's nice to know you've got the headroom um, if you're using our cloud platform. Number seven, or number eight, sorry. Uh, so an example of this, there's a song contest similar to American Idol, which is run in Europe every year called Eurovision. It's the uh, one of the largest televised events in the world that is not a sporting event. Um, they get 125 million live viewers every year. Last year, they decided they wanted to have a second screen experience. They wanted to have a, an app on the phone where people could interact with what was going on with the show. Um, they had no idea how popular this was going to be. They know they've got a lot of viewers out there. They know there's a lot of phones out there, but there's going to be 1% of their users that use the app, 10%, everybody. What features of the app are they going to use? This stuff's really hard to predict. Um, they were working with one of our partners at uh, Scalar, and Scalar built a back end for them. And at one point during their semifinals, uh, uh, requests went up by a factor of five. Um, and it happened very quickly. It was the show was on the TV and the requests start coming in. But Scalar was able to stand up new servers very, very quickly to handle the load. Um, and at the end, you know, their answer to the previous question was how many, how many requests did they need? They made it up to 50,000 requests per second. That was their peak. Um, but they had no idea that was their peak. And if they had to predict that in advance, it was a success disaster waiting to happen. Yeah? Do they, do they have all of the, the, the back end nodes already spun up and ready to go? 
uh, or, or is that something where they're auto scaling up now? Um, I don't know how auto the scaling was. There might have been a human involved. Um, I believe the backends that we're talking about were compute engine backends, and so they were standing up new nodes. So this wasn't just App Engine doing what App Engine does for everybody all the time. This was compute engine nodes spinning up and down. However, the the um, the thing is, there's an API for compute engine, right? You can have a computer program that's spinning up new nodes for you. So you can watch, like like in your example, you can watch a task queue. For example, you can see the queue backing up and say, I need more capacity here. Let's spin up some more nodes. All very easy to do pro programmatically. And as we'll see in a later slide, it's also very fast. Number seven, Google Cloud is great. So Google has been carbon neutral uh, since about 2007. Um, and that's company-wide. That's not just a piece of our company. That's all of Google as a whole has zero carbon footprint. So how do we do that? Um, we buy renewable resources where we can. Where we can't, um, we buy high quality carbon offsets um, to increase the supply of renewable energy so that we can buy more in the future. We invest in projects like you see here, wind farms and solar farms to increase the supply of renewable energy. We make these long term investments. Um, you know, if you're a, a small startup and you care deeply about the environment and you're looking to, you know, either host your stuff yourself or host your stuff in the cloud, and this is an important thing to you, you can know that if you're hosting your stuff in our cloud, your app has a zero carbon footprint, at least for that portion of it. And then you can look at the rest of your business and, and, and make your own choices. But let's say that's not a compelling argument to you for whatever reason. Um, it also makes great business sense to run a business this way because the more renewable energy Google uses, the more we're insulated from fluctuations in the cost of carbon particularly the long-term fluctuations over time. But it's not just on the consumption side where it makes a lot of sense. Because we're deeply committed to the environment, we use as little energy as possible to begin with. So that shows up in a couple of ways. Um, our servers themselves are very energy efficient. Um, so we probably use less energy uh, than the industry average to perform the same amount of computation storage or networking. But this is an interesting graph here. And this is uh, power usage efficiency. And this says our power usage efficiency is 1.12. We, is that good, is that bad? What exactly does that mean? Um, this means for every joule of energy that goes uh, into a data center that's actually used to perform computation, storage, or network, networking, the stuff we actually care about, only 0.12 joules of energy uh, is used to do all the other stuff keeping the lights on, cooling the building down, doing power transformation, doing power distribution, all that stuff. So is this a good number? Well, the industry average for 2012 was about 1.8. So yeah, this is a very good number. This means we use less power to provide the same service. This means we can provide the same service for a lower cost and offer it to you for a lower price. So even if the green argument is not compelling to you. There's a very strong economic argument that backs it up. Okay, number six, supercharged disks. So disks are interesting, right? Um, they haven't changed much since the 1960s. We still have spinning plates and heads moving back and forth to read the data on them. And no matter how good Moore's law is, it doesn't help us move metal around, which is what you've got to do when you're reading or writing uh, to a disk. Now, we've done some amazing things with the density with which we can store information on these spinning platters. So we get these you know, relatively small disks. I mean, disks in the 60s were the size of this, this table here. Now, we get two terabytes on something that looks like that. It's amazing. Um, but that's led to a different problem, which is the number of um, IOs per second, IOPS, the number of reads and writes we can perform per gigabyte is actually going down over time because we're stuffing so much data onto so few spindles, we can't get our data on and off as efficiently as we used to, which is a strange problem. Um, so that's you know, the, 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 the rough stats you can get on a two terabyte physical disk. If you provision a two terabyte persistent disk, which is the you know, moral equivalent of a hard drive in the cloud that you would attach to one of your um, compute engine instances, you get roughly the same sequential read and write throughput, but you get significantly higher 
IOs per second for small reads and writes, somewhere between 8 and 32 times as high. Well, how do we do this, you know, amazing thing? How do we defeat the laws of physics and make that thing on the left go faster? Well, of course we don't. What we have is a lot of these things on the left that are working in tandem to provide this illusion of a two terabyte disk that can provide a lot more IOs per second. And, you know, for anybody uh, who has read some of the, you know, seminal Google papers, um, this won't be terribly surprising because you can read the Google file system paper and say, yeah, they strike their data across a bunch of different drives, they break it up into chunks, and then you can read multiple chunks off multiple different hard drives, and that's how you can get a higher throughput. Um, so hard drives in the cloud are actually better than hard drives that are physically attached to the machine in certain ways. So, yes, of course we're limited by bandwidth at some point, right? We don't have infinite bandwidth. We haven't invented that yet. Um, we're working on it, but we haven't quite got there yet. The time machine's also, you know, coming. Um, Sorry, <laughs> um, But from what you can see on, on this slide, you get the same throughput right now that you would get with a physical disk, right? So the disk that you get in the cloud is going to perform roughly the same as the disk you would attach to the machine from a throughput or bandwidth perspective. It's like a large amount of data then contain this problem. But as you deal with more data, chances are you're hitting more drives, more physical drives. Okay. So, and, and this is the interesting thing. I actually wrote a, um, <laughs> wrote a blog post to explain this because I was at another developer event and somebody was, was really digging in on you know, the details of, well, how do you configure your distributed file system? And it's a hard question to answer because the answers change over time. And um, the, the, the magic thing about this is, you know, I, I, I geek out on this stuff. I totally geek out on this stuff. I, I love distributed file systems. It's, as I said earlier, it's kind of one of the things that brought me to Google. Um, and when I got here, I started looking at what Google had produced. And um, I was amazed to find that, you know, if you read the, the GFS paper, um, at that time, we were for every byte of data you would store, we were storing it three times because we would replicate all the chunks three times, right? Um, and that kind of became the industry standard and, the, and how people thought about how distributed file systems would work. Well, we've moved on since then. We've got this new thing called Colossus, which other people have talked about, so I can talk about it as well. And the cool thing about that is it uses something called Reed Solomon encoding where we don't store complete chunks of data, we store this really interesting mathematical formula of your data. I, do, I don't even pretend to understand the math, and there's no way I can explain it to somebody else. But the upshot of it is we get more reliable storage, and for every byte of data, we only have to store one and a half bytes on average. So we're using half the space that we used to back in the GFS days, and we're getting more reliability for it. So that's, that's the magic of letting Somebody who is much better than I am at distributed file systems and encoding and things like that manage that portion of the stack. I just get to sit back and enjoy the benefits of paying less money and getting more um, reliability out of it. So how this applies to this is we're putting together this bundle of technology which kind of looks and feels like a hard drive and we're giving you this level of sequential read-write. We're doing a lot of stuff under the covers to make sure we can do that reliably. So other tricks you can do with disks in the cloud that are harder to do with physical disks, you can move them between machines really easily. It's a couple of API calls and suddenly, um, you know, your disk is detached from VM1 and it's attached to VM2. Um, you can share volumes in a read-only way between many, um, uh, between many VMs. So let's say, for example, you have, uh, you have a, a database you want to share or a bundle of files you want to share between a thousand virtual machines. Well, you could copy that a thousand times onto a thousand persistent disks and mount those up. That's a lot of copying, that's a lot of management to do. Or you can have one copy of it and just mount that read-only disk on all thousand machines. And then it's really easy to manage. You change it one place, it changes everywhere. Yeah? Could that look like one disk even across different regions, different data centers? I don't know the answer to that question. Do you know the answer to that question? The question was, when you mount, can you mount a PD across regions and... PDs are a normal resource, so they're just, that's what your disk being attached to instances that are in the same cell. Okay. Effectively, I think it's... Yeah. Right. Yeah. So snapshots, however, are global. Right. Sure. Do you think a snapshot of the disk can restore anywhere? Right. Um, you can do big 
trade volume. Currently, you cannot buy a 10 terabyte physical disk, but we can provision a 10 terabyte um, persistent disk for you. Um, and finally, one thing that we like about physical disks is we buy the disk and we don't have to put five cents in a jar every time we read and write data from it. Um, so this pricing model makes sense to people. It's like, I've asked for this much space. I know how much that's going to cost. This is what my bill is going to look like at the end of the month. So we don't charge extra for IOs. We assume that you're getting a disk because you'd like to read and write your data from that disk. <laughs> and we price it accordingly. OK, consistent performance. Um, I've said it before. I'll say it again. Google's been doing um, cloud computing for a long time for our internal stuff. Now, one thing about doing um, efficient cloud computing is you're dealing with a multi-tenant environment. That means you've got this big pool of machines, and you've got multiple services that are all sharing. So Google does not do the thing where we have product A that goes out and it buys 10,000 machines for itself, and, only, and those 10,000 machines only run stuff for product A. And product B does the same thing. It's horribly inefficient. Um, so we've always been in a world at Google where different services were sharing the same machine. Um, that's the multi-tenant problem. You have or also called the noisy neighbor problem, where you have um, one, uh, one process on a machine that's using a lot of networking or a lot of CPU or a lot of storage, and other tenants of that same machine notice decreased performance because of it. Guess what? Google developers hate that just as much as everyone else does. It's terrible. You want to know that if I'm running this many tasks, this is the performance I can expect. I know how many tasks I need to provision, and I don't want that to go up and down over time, and I don't want that to be different if I'm running on machine A versus machine B. I want this consistent performance. So we've been working on that consistency for a long time, and that just shows up in our platform. Um, now, so what, what is this graph looking at? How is this graph making the case of, first of all, we have a customer quote here. You can read it yourself. Basically, he says, I love your stuff because the performance is really consistent. We love to hear that feedback. So what we have here, these are called violin graphs. And what this is showing is we ran this benchmark called the core mark over and over and over again on, in this case, two core machines. And then if it took you know, this long, then we add sort of weight to this part of the graph. If it takes this long, then we add weight to this part of the graph. So what we can see is most of the time, the benchmark took exactly the same amount of time right in here. And then we've kind of got this long tail, and we've got a little tail in this direction too. That's kind of weird, right? One of our engineers took a look at that and said, why is this not a perfect graph? Why does it take different amount, amounts of time? What is, what is the root cause for this? And uh, that engineer dug into the problem for a while, found something, and made a change. And if you run that same benchmark today, you get this graph. So this may seem like a small thing. This graph isn't actually that bad, right? This is quite good. This is way better. You know, this, is, this is very good. Um, it's this kind of obsessive compulsive attention to consistency over a long period of time that allows us to generate quotes like this from our customers. Because we have people doing this. This is a CPU example, but we have people doing this with the storage stack and with the networking stack and thinking about these sorts of multi-tenant problems. And we're doing it not just for all you guys. We're doing it for ourselves, too, because we love consistency just as much as you guys do. Number four, live migration. So here we have a picture of somebody doing something to a server. I have no idea what. Yeah. Probably absolutely nothing. No doubt, completely staged. But um, the point is, stuff breaks, right? And then there's those pesky operating system upgrades, and there's patches to install, and there's all this weird stuff that um, every once in a while, you just got to turn a machine off or reboot it. Um, but you know what? That's our problem. That shouldn't be your problem. So we have this thing called live migration. And if we need to reboot a machine or turn a machine off or turn a rack of machines off because there's a power problem, we have the ability to take your machine and just basically take its state and bring it up over here and do that in a way that does not interrupt your processes, does not interrupt your network connection. As far as your machine is concerned, nothing happens. The world is the same. There's a little event in, a, in an event log somewhere that says, by the way, you got moved. That's it. Um, I was reading up a little bit more on this today. 
in anticipation of getting some questions about it. Um, I'm still not terribly expert in this feature, so I'll probably have to go up to the audience for uh, backup. But it was really entertaining because somebody who wasn't us published a thing saying, we wanted to test this out because we weren't sure how it was going to work out. So we told Google, we set up this test harness, we were doing all these requests and stuff, and we told Google, migrate our machines, we want to see what happens. So we actually migrated all their machines twice, like over to um, another rack and then back to another rack or another region and back to another region. I'm not sure what it was. And uh, at the end of the day, they called us up and said, did you do it? And that's the best thing we could have heard because they could not notice anything in their own logs to indicate that this has happened to them twice during the day. It was completely invisible to them. That's pretty cool. Zero to 138. So we talked about Eurovision earlier and how they needed to spin up a bunch of new virtual machines. Well, how quickly can you do that? Here we have a bunch more violin graphs. Apparently, Mike loves violin graphs. So he puts them all throughout his, uh, his presentation. This is my favorite one over here. This one shows how long did it take to start up 100 virtual machines. So this is like press enter, how long before those machines are up and running. And in the long tail up here, worst case, it's 38 seconds. That's a lot of machines in a little bit of time. So if you need to, and, and the other thing that's interesting here is this is the graph for one machine. You can see these graphs are all kind of in the same place. I, I would anticipate that if this continued off the slide over in this direction for a thousand machines and so on, we'd still see things happening in less than a minute. Um, so because you can do this programmatically and because the machines come up really quickly, you can scale fast if you have set up your infrastructure to do so. And that's pretty powerful. Yeah? So I have to ask, why is the fastest spin up time machine instead of one machine? I got nothing. <laughs> because the world is a strange, strange place. <laughs> do you guys talk to it at all? Like, can you keep a, a, a set of machines already did it up right here? So um, I think the question may not have an answer. What I mean is when booting a virtual machine doesn't actually, like, Boot a physical machine. Sure, no, I got that. Okay. But it's taking 38 seconds to this. I don't have an answer to that. Okay. Um, I don't know why the number's not zero. Um, I also. So, when, when you ask for a new machine, you take an image and you boot it up from BIOS to Um uh, we, we do not give you a machine that's like, been sitting under a, a warming light waiting for you, right? It's not McDonald's, which is fast. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. We're going to use that quote. <laughs> <laughs> you McDonald's, actually. Yeah, <laughs> the trouble is, then you have to take a Big Mac, right? You can't have, you can't have, you know, your own special You guys are doing thing. it. You guys can have, uh, you know, home makes of uh, I have sure already <laughs> All right. So, number two. Uh, per minute, what does this mean? Well, this, this little stair-step graph shows the difference in the amount of money you pay for a virtual machine if you're paying by the hour and rounding up versus paying by the minute. Obviously, we like this graph because we charge by the minute and we think that's pretty cool. So if you spin up a machine and leave it up for a year and then turn it off at the end, this graph doesn't matter to you at all, right? Nobody cares. Um, but in most applications, your machines kind of fall into two categories. You've got some long-running machines, in which case this isn't so compelling. And then you've got some machines that you spill up, spin up in response to increased load. So maybe you have a daily cycle that you're trying to deal with. Um, even if you're just growing, um, you're still spinning up new machines. Um, and then the second class is um, if you're spinning up some machines for analysis jobs. So the classic example is, um, I'm going to run a Hadoop cluster to churn through a whole bunch of data that's sitting in cloud storage. I'm going to spin it up, and I'm going to run it for an hour, and then I'm going to shut all those machines down. Um, and maybe you spun up, you know, 10 machines to do that, or 100 machines to do that, and you got your answer in an hour. Well, would you like your answer in 10 minutes instead? Would that work for you? Because you could spin up 600 machines and get your answer in 10 minutes versus 100 machines. If we build by the hour, you're going to pay six times as much to get your answer six times faster. But if we build by the minute, you pay exactly the same amount. All you get is a faster answer. Um, so in those analysis scenarios, um, 
filling by the minute makes a big difference. And the other thing is, it's not just sub-hour times that matter. I mean, if you look at this graph, really, until you get to 100 hours or so, the per hour billing is not a rounding error. Like, at 10 hours, that's a 10% price jump, depending on where you fall in that hour. So it, even, even at the scale of a day, or several days, it's still significant. Well, if billing by the minute is cool, or I should say if leasing time by the minute is cool, leasing time by the second is even cooler. Effectively, this is what you get to do with BigQuery. I mean, I touched on BigQuery a little bit at the beginning, but you can load your data into BigQuery and um, run SQL-like queries across it and get, uh, get answers extremely quickly on huge data sets. The, um, the, the technology that underlies uh, BigQuery is called Dremel. And Dremel was developed here at Google because we have some fairly large data sets, and people wanted to explore them in an interactive way. They didn't want to have to run a MapReduce job that might run for an hour or two, get an answer, and say, huh, that's interesting, but I wish I'd asked this other question. Now you run another job for another couple of hours. You say, huh, well, that's interesting, too, but now I really wish I'd asked this third question. So Dremel was created to reduce that iteration cycle. So you could ask a question, get an answer in seconds, not minutes or hours. Um, and so you can do that, too, with BigQuery now. Just load your data into BigQuery. You can, you can get your answer in seconds, too. And effectively, what you're doing is leasing a few seconds worth of time across thousands of machines at Google, each of which is analyzing a very small slice of your data. And, um, and that's pretty cool. So that's the top 10 list as it stands today. Um, please add me on Google+. I'd love to share more insights with you on that form. And if you've got any more questions, I'd be happy to have Benson an answer for you. <laughs> <laughs> SMB network file system to get at stuff. Um, so you could probably still do that um, from one virtual machine to another because they can talk to each other. Um, so you can potentially write some stuff in a modern way that's sitting next to these older applications. And they can share data, but it's going to be kind of clunky because you're going to have to ask for that data from that application. Um, now, there are. Um, you know, you can, you can start to tease those things apart. So, for example, if you can get it to give up its data somehow, like maybe it's uh, built on top of a SQL database, and you can pry that piece out, and you can, you can make enough changes at that interface so that now it's running in Cloud SQL instead of in a, um, you know, a SQL database running on the virtual machine. You know, that, that's helpful, right? You've just handed a bunch of DevOps to us by running it in Cloud SQL instead of on those, on those VMs. And you can continue to sort of pry pieces off and then, more importantly, build the new pieces, you know, in, in the cloud infrastructure. And then eventually you'll have more new stuff than you do old stuff. But it's, 
it's a lot of work. I mean, there's a lot of there's a lot of businesses that have custom stuff that they've written um, over a long period of time that they have a lot of data in, and and it's going to take a long time for all of that stuff to um, to come over. Yeah. So, uh, what kind of support does Google have for like a lightweight Linux container, Docker containers, things like that? You know, if you if you're trying to architect your app, uh, even a so uh, you can run Docker on your VM instances. That works great. Um, and uh, I've, I've seen at least one sample that does that. Um, in terms of, you know, that's kind of a different layer of containment than the actual mm -hmm. virtual machine. And the virtual machine and Docker kind of work nicely together that way. Um, you can imagine, like, the customer is saying, I'm going to define my whole app as a collection of Docker containers yep. and there's their configuration scripts. I just want to hand that to you, Google, and you go manage that. You build that so that that thing left. I would just say stay tuned. <laughs> um, there are people who are working on Docker stuff who are at BlueCon this week. No say some things. Mm -hmm. There's Googlers going to Docker on a couple weeks later who will say some things. And we got IO. So okay. Docker. Pay attention. Pay attention. <laughs> <laughs> yes. I mean, kind of a naive user, but I get questions from people. So, we have a couple of months. Do they have metering infrastructure? We're talking way too thousand machines. And they're like, but why don't you? We can't because this is a certified, regulated process like several government agencies. Mm -hmm. So while it is trivial for them to get a buy-off on a mirror of that process that we only change one thing, if they have to rewrite or anything, it launches a multi-million dollar cascade in, in time, also years and years. And so the dream is that I can image their hard drive <laughs> and, <laughs> and that um, so is anybody working that direction, and I, you know, the video card, you know, all that machine dependent is there, but to some extent, couldn't it be dealt with? I've seen, you know, like off crack go through, it's ping on hardware until it, you know, figures out something that works. Is that anywhere on the Well, page? so there's, there's, um, <coughs> There's a couple things in that question which I'll touch on, and and I'm sorry, I'm probably not going to answer the question, but it does yeah, raise a couple of interesting. But I'll, I'll apologize in advance and acknowledge that I'm not answering your question. Um, first of all, there's a bunch of industries that have alphabet soups of certifications that are required to do anything, and we'd love to have those customers, but it's early days for cloud. Um, we have some certifications, and if you go to our website or talk to our salespeople, they would love to tell you which of those acronyms we have and which we're working on, and I don't really know the list, and I don't know for your industry which ones are important. Um, but if there is some three-letter acronym that uh, some regulation requires you to have, there's a chance that some or all of our services may have those things. So that's one, that's one answer that's sort of a general answer for everyone. The whole image a, an ancient machine in such a way that it doesn't break whatever certification like, which sounds like it was a hardware software certification. Oh, why, yeah. Yeah, I just, I just don't see that happening, honestly, because, like, if it was a software certification, like, if your code wasn't changing and you were just swapping out virtualized device drivers for real device drivers, yeah. Yeah. right, you know, that, that, that's possible. But the question is, what operating system is that running on? Is that something that's running in our cloud? You know, it's, it's not a... It's certainly not a trivial thing. Now, is there some clever third party out there that can probably make a business out of that and run their stuff in our infrastructure? That might be true. Maybe you can start that business. When I provision like Amazon's infrastructure in my application, you have to choose it, usually choose a data center, choose, you know, Virginia or Oregon or some other location. So I got a, a large SaaS application. It's really going back to your SDN slide. 
doesn't look as if it's on Google, like that I need to choose a geographic location to uh, host my, my VM. It, it's, it's product dependent. What I mean by that is your VM is in a particular region, which is essentially a synonym, synonym for data center, um, roughly speaking. But we have, uh, sorry, we have, I misspoke. There's, there's three levels. There's sort of continental level granularity, like is it in the United States or is it in Europe or is it in Asia? There's uh, region level granularity, like US East, for example. And then there's zone granularity, which is US East A, US East B. And there are certain things that have to happen at a zone level and certain things that happen at a regional level and certain things that are continental level. For example, Cloud storage buckets can be defined at one of the one of two levels, depending on your needs. So you can say, I just want a bucket that's in the U.S. and all your data is somewhere in the U.S. and that's as detailed as you need to be about it, and we handle the rest. Um, but with uh, an actual VM that runs at the at the lowest node, you choose a particular zone in which to run that VM. Now, because of the live migration, though. Um, as we do work in that zone, we can move your stuff out of the way of that work, so you never really have to move out, so to speak, to a new zone. Yeah? Do you guys have any presentations or material published about how the uh, data storage center networking is engineered? The inter-data center networking. Sorry, the inside the data center. Inside the data center? Uh, very likely not. I will take that feedback back to the people who could potentially give that presentation. Because I'd love to give that presentation, sure. but I, oh, yeah. I can't. No, no, no. <laughs> well, thanks, everybody. Thanks for your interest. Thank you. Kind of like ask if if any folks folks have, can have some open uh, open positions open jobs. So I know that whenever we have these meetups, there's kind of just the the world it is. Like folks are always kind of looking for for some positions. So sometimes that's actually why they come here. And uh, then folks sometimes may have some positions. So I think we have a variety of folks here. So if anybody's kind of got anything interesting, I know there's a couple of folks here are looking. So. Um, Anybody got anything? Yeah, I'll stand up and be first. We're good at that. Um, my name is Ben Malay. I've got a uh, startup a couple blocks up here. We're doing a uh, cloud networking solution. Got some interest in uh, the data life of packet type information through Google. Uh, and we're uh, hiring BC++ engineers and uh, JavaScript engineers and UX designers and plus developers and engineers and staff. And uh, quite a few other things as well. So <laughs> if you're interested in this startup, uh, we're, we're doing awesome. We've got about nine people. So I work for a, uh, a company on the side that is a marketplace for cloud service providers. And we're looking for a solution for architects. So if you know anybody or you can just ask them to Cool, cool. How about one more? Hi, I'm Ian Kevin. I'm with Adobe and I'm on the YouTube publishing team there and I'm looking for a site like Adobe engineer. So if you're interested in delivering magazine content like Time Magazine and New Yorker and National Geographic to uh, tablets and mobile devices uh, worldwide. I uh, want for an SRE to join the team and help us scale that infrastructure and the solution. Cool. All right. And <coughs> I'm just Mark. I think I work for a team pioneer square. It's a Scala and Java first time. You want some? You are one? Cool. Sounds like some currencies like the issue, yeah? Hey, and by the way, uh, so Ben and I are actually going to try and join forces and, and uh, arrange a uh, meeting uh, with Seattle Android and, and GDG Seattle around maybe Chromecast. We're kind of, yeah, something yeah, If anybody knows uh, Kush, uh, we're trying to persuade him to uh, come and be our speaker. So <laughs> we'll provide, like, donuts, whatever else he wants. <laughs> 
All right. Okay. Well, thanks very much for coming out. Thank you.